Belly in. <laughs> Telling you now, I'm no thinner than I was last time. <laughs> it's only about two hours after. That's why. Don't tell him that. Come on. <laughs> I know we're in the same clothes. So we uh, we had a good chat um, about your career, Jake. Last time uh, you were here, or like yeah, yeah, earlier. A couple of hours ago, yeah. Um, but you wanted to chat a little bit more about directing, and we thought it might be a good little, I don't know, little, little half an hour. Uh, slot that we could squeeze in? Yeah, I think probably less than that, to be honest. I just think that obviously when I was here last time, discussed a lot about the marketing side of it, the analysis and all that kind of stuff that you do initially. Yeah. But I never really went that much into the physical directing side of things, which is obviously something I'm really passionate about as well. Um, so I just thought it makes sense to maybe go into the different kinds of shoots, really, and the different crews that you work with and how you kind of adapt from one to another really cool so obviously you've probably directed stuff that's like a bigger crew down to like a smaller skeleton type crew yeah um how do they differ in terms of i guess it's just like speed and output and like again just before we came on camera we were talking about that thing of sometimes you need you need to get through things quite quickly. Yeah. So that, how does that then impact on who you choose to work with? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it's very hard because I think in this industry, it's very easy to kind of, um, once you've got a crew that you enjoy working with, to kind of stick with those same people. You know, you work well with certain individuals. You think they'd be really strong and they'd be great to get in on this particular job. Um, and I think... The challenge that I always have when it comes to crewing on things and then obviously managing that team is the levels of crew that you apply to different kinds of productions. So I think that sometimes, you know, from my end, I want to make great visuals. I want to do amazing stuff. And naturally you think, you know, I want to work with a big team. I want DOPs. I want assistant directors. I want to have it all going on. But actually, it might be overkill and too much or not quite right for the kind of production that you're doing. So if it's a smaller commercial, like a product video for a lawnmower, for example, you know, and you're showing the 10 features of it or whatever, you know, you want to shoot that beautifully. You think, oh, I'm going to make this stunning. But if it's literally just going on, you know, social media or it's on Amazon as part of the sales videos, whatever it is, then actually it's, it's overkill. And you find that a lot of the times on those shoots, they have to be very fast paced. You know, you've got a lot of visuals which you need to capture through that day. Um, and I think then working with a bigger team becomes more of a challenge. There's a lot more moving parts. And instead of being able to go and, you know, quickly just shoot a side angle of something or move around and just make sure you get an extra wide so you've got a safe or whatever it is that you need to do, um, it becomes more of a challenge because you've got then half an hour of moving gear and setting things up again. So you've got to be, you've got to know before you shoot on those kind of things exactly what you need to get. Yeah. Which means that there's no flexibility on the day really. Um, with the smaller teams, um, either whether that's obviously self-shooting or whether it's just working with say yourself um, and an assistant or whatever it might be, we can be a lot more flexible. We're kind of quicker in, in terms of our setups. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, there's been times where we've been working together where I've said, can we just go in? get this angle here or the client would like to see a couple of options for this scene and we're able to just really quickly just add them in even if they're not used afterwards it gives us those choices so i guess that's what that fent uh, tractor shoot was a bit like that wasn't it sort of like we had intentions to like do big setups at the start and then as the day went on it sort of got gradually like quicker and quicker and quicker yeah and then it was like, like we need to just grab this, we just need to grab that. James, yeah. just get it, yeah. Um, so <laughs> like, hopefully that'll be out by the time this comes out and we can show a little clip of that now um, so you can see that. Yeah. Um, but if yeah, not, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is supposed to be out soon. Um, so, yeah. Um, so say, say if someone came to you and like you had a massive budget, but it was for something quite simple. Yeah. Like how would you then approach that? So say if it was just like a lawnmower thing in a garden, for instance. Yeah. Obviously, you're probably going to want a HMI on set or something just yeah. to give you that sunlight if if you need it. Um, but like, what would you, what would you do if it was like you sort of knew in your head that like 
you benefit from a smaller team, yet yeah. you've got the money to spend on <laughs> a bigger team. It's a challenging question, actually. I don't even know how to approach that one. Um, Would you just, like, get a better camera or...? To be honest, it usually then comes down to more output. I think that you end up then delivering them not just more one, stuff, yeah. but more stuff. Yeah, I think that there's a certain level of crew that you get to where you go, having any more is quite frankly ridiculous, you know, because you're not going to Well, you have... need other people to manage those other people as well, don't you? Well, yeah, exactly. So you sort of yeah. create another role as like... a second team yeah. in a way, you know, yeah. that helps to support. Yeah, there's like that support team and everything. But I think the stuff that I'm used to working on, if it ever comes down to we've got extra money, it will then go into output. So we'll deliver the 60 second, but there will also be a 30 second social media cut. Um, or individual feature-based um, clips that might be 10 seconds long, something like that. So it usually goes into the edit, I think, more than anything. And then we can put more into the post-production, sound mix, the colour grade, and all of those sorts of things. There's two things that I think are really important for me when it comes to, as a director, and that's, for me, a really good DOP and a really good um, colour grader. Because I think that having those two things working closely together will give me the look and the feel that naturally I want to want to achieve. Um, and I think that, you know, I have those initial conversations with DOPs. There's two or three DOPs that I work with, um, obviously one being yourself. And I like to get you involved um, as early as possible. So even when I've just had the brief, even if I haven't even quoted it out yet, I'd like to have a conversation to say, this is the kind of thing that's come through. What do you think? Because it might give me inspiration and ideas and I want to take that on board. And as I've always said, and um, I've put it, you know, it's on the, on, the, on the new website, is that for me, film is a very collaborative effort. It's a big team effort on the day and I don't think that it should just be on that day. I think it has to be beforehand as well. So, you know, having that relationship, I think is really strong. Um, and then obviously with the grade afterwards, being able to get what you wanted to achieve on the day is really important. Um, otherwise, you know, you can shoot some amazing stuff. You get the bigger teams in, you use Aries, you use Reds. If the footage in the end then is just, you know, graded, you know, terribly, then you may as well have shot it on an I, you know, an A7S or an FS7 or something like that, standard. Um, so I think there's definitely always a bit of a wrestle and a struggle and a bit of to and fro when it comes to setups. Because we were talking as well about, like, obviously for people starting out, they might be on, like, um, you know, mirrorless cameras now, I suppose, rather than DSLRs, but, like, you know, A7S3s or A7S2s or whatever the latest one is. Um, you know, like, um, um, we, we always talk about that thing of, like, yeah, it's nice to have all the flashy gear, mm. but actually sometimes the client isn't going to know <laughs> Notice the difference. Obviously, it's impressive if you yeah. turn up with a big truckload of stuff. Um, but generally, like, there's that balance of, like, you know, how much does it help or hinder you in terms of speed? And one, like, the visually now, because the mirrorless cameras are so good, Yeah. Um, you know, like, does it make much of a difference to the final output? Sometimes it doesn't really, does it? To be honest, when, it's when you're social, putting it on a phone, well, that's it. When it's you know, most of the stuff that we do is probably viewed on mobile um, and within apps and social media and stuff like that. You know, it probably doesn't make that much of a difference. I think a lot of the, a lot of it for me is I'm looking ahead and I'm going. I eventually want to be shooting commercials yeah. on Aries and Reds and stuff like that. So if I can get them in early and I can learn to be practicing with them, I can be on set and familiar with it. Yeah. And I've obviously got the behind the scenes and the creds then to say I've worked with those cameras and things and those teams. Then it kind of gives me a little bit more clout when I'm trying to go for those bigger jobs, yeah. which is why I've always kind of spec'd it out a little bit more than I probably should really. And I guess obviously for all the crew that are involved as well, like if you, you're you not going to get a massive crew shooting on A7S because they're just not made for big crews, are they? They're not made to be rigged up. They're not made to well, exactly. have an AC work with them. And... Yeah, because that's, that's what you've got to consider. You know, if you want to get a DOP in who's using an Ari Alexa Mini, it's then not just him. It's not a one-man job. You've then straight away you've got, got an AC. An assistant, yeah. Yeah, you've then, yeah, you've got to think about you know additional screens. You've got to think about focus pulling. Yeah. If you're using primes, then you want, obviously, a focus puller, the certain lenses. It becomes a much more complex operation, yeah. um, which is why I don't think I've ever been on a shoot where it's like a two-man crew, but we're using 
an Alexa or something like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, it never happens that way. It's always, the minute those cameras are in, there's at least eight of us basically yeah. on location. So when you're on set, yeah. you've obviously got like a, a monitor to watch and things like that. Um, how easy is it like to, when you're watching something, it's perhaps like what you had in your head, but it's not quite working on, on the screen. How would you then go about like sort of being sort of flexible to try something new? And how much input do you have from the DOP at that point as well? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I think that obviously a lot of what we do, you've got to have the eye for it. And as I've said previously, you can know every technical thing under the sun about how to frame a shot, how to, how to you know, um, put the characters in the right place and things like that. But if you're watching it back, you just know if it's not quite hitting the mark like it should do. And I think that there's many a time where I'll film, I'll have something filmed, an actor will have performed something or whatever it might be. And you'll kind of watch it through and you'll just kind of say cut and you'll just have about 20 seconds just thinking, what is it about that that I'm not quite sure about? So then obviously I'll get playback, I'll end up just watching that through again. And sometimes it's very small things. It could be a pause that somebody's put into their words. It could be how long they've waited until they've walked off camera um, or the way they've put a glass down. It's very simple little things that basically make a shot as sleek and as professional as you want it to be. Um, so there's always a bit of to in and fro in and from my end as well, again that's another collaborative thing so I will then speak with the DOPs because sometimes the light might not just feel quite right, you know, the way that it's framed might just be a little bit off. So then we'll have those discussions and basically say, you know, how about we tweak that slightly, how about we bring that light in, flag that over there and just see how, see how things look um, and eventually, a little bit like painting a picture with the layers, you know, it ends up becoming what you wanted it to be, um, but sometimes you don't always get that first time, um, even if you've sort of, you know, had an hour set up until you've actually rolled the cameras and, and had a good look through. Yeah. And that's a challenge when you're working with a bigger team as well, because as I've said, on the shoots that aren't necessarily huge budgets, you haven't got a lot of time. So if I'm then wanting to tweak things and I want it to be perfect and I'm getting frustrated because I'm like, I know we can get this. I just need another 20 minutes. But you've got an AD saying we've got to move on now. Mm. You know, it's a challenge. I think that's, that's why um, it's good whenever I work sort of like with directors like yourself, like having a big monitor. Like for me, I always feel like when you're working with like the viewfinders and the small screens, like you just, it's hard sometimes to miss, you miss those little nuances that make something really great. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like it's always good to, as well, have, have like your eye over it as well as me coming to have a look at something on a monitor. Yeah. There's so many times I work with stuff and it's just like on a small five inch screen and like stuff gets missed. Do you, you know do what miss I mean? things, yeah. It could be a slight glance to camera from somebody that you've missed and you just don't want that, you know. Yeah. And that's what's making it not feel as authentic as it should be. Um, so, yeah, you definitely do. Moving, yeah, moving away from directing very slightly into more of like the DOP type role. Yeah. So that's something I found out, I think it was the start of last year. Um, you know, I I had an assistant who was framing up for me okay. while Seb was doing all the lighting and I found that so helpful. Really? Okay. Yeah, just because I, I was taking my head out of the viewfinder and out of the camera. Yeah. And I was just with the monitor with You could physically the kind of, in a way, direct the and lighting. I'm not, I'm not concentrating on, you know, having a heavy camera on my shoulder. Yeah. I'm not trying to block out, you know, all this stuff and look at a small screen. Yeah, and it was ama I was amazed at how much I pick, how much more I picked up. Yeah, and what like you know, I was like, oh yeah, let's tweak that. Whereas if I had that heavy, heavy camera on my shoulder, I'd be like, yep, yeah, let's record. Yeah, let's get on with heavy. it. Yeah, of course. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's yeah. like you, you you have so many distractions and you're actually holding the camera. I mean, I did operate on it, um, but like just for like setups or like the initial initial shot, I found that so helpful. One question I think I've got for you actually is from a DOP point of view, yeah. and I know we're going a little bit off, but I think it's interesting. Well, the director, as a DOP, director though, DOP relationships, like that's probably one of the most important, isn't it? Really? Well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But do you always find that as a DOP, you're a self shooting DOP? Or have you ever been on a job where you're literally there as a DOP I mean, and you've got a separate camera op who at, does bits and bobs with you? At the moment, I'm always like a self shooter, but I guess. You get those luxuries when you move up the ladder, I suppose. 
Um, I mean, or, there's been times though when you see Roger Deakin who's got a camera on his shoulder. You I mean, know. A lot of the time they like to shoot themselves anyway, don't they? Yeah. But, however, I did find it very helpful, like I said before, about having someone else to frame up initially for you so you can see the light and how it's moving and just be a bit more hands-on to say, right, gaffer, you know, I think we need to just like flag that bit or bring it, bring the light round a bit yeah. more. Um, but yeah, I mean, like obviously that that's like a luxury I'd like to have. I think I'd always like to operate personally um, just because I'd feel like if anything goes wrong, it's my fault. Okay. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. my mistake. Okay. And yeah. we all make mistakes, like especially on that, like, um, you know, the Westminster Trains job where we've got a lot of stuff going on. You know, like it's easy for me. I can be a bit more um, forgiving on myself in a way because I'm... I know what I'm trying to do. Right, yeah. As if I didn't quite get it right. Yeah. Um, if I didn't quite get it right, at least I'll have learnt and I'll think, well, I need to start turning a bit quicker, the gimbal a bit yeah. quicker or whatever at that yeah. specific point. Yeah, that's good. It does um, help in that way. Whereas when you... I mean, I guess it's di difficult to say because like, if you're a DOP and you're watching the screen and you've got an operator who you know knows what they're doing, you can probably relay that message and it'll get through. But sometimes... Yeah. I've worked with people in the past and I've felt like I have actually worked with some people before and they'll do some shots and I'll be like, I'll tell them what I think is wrong with it. Yeah. It's like the next time it's the same. Yeah. And it's not. And it's, well, like, that's it's that thing, isn't it? Of just like having to keep trying new little things to yeah. get it right. Yeah. And I suppose from a DOP, it's very similar. In I think, terms I, of I think especially with gimbal work for me, I feel like it's, um, because Steadicam sort of feels a lot more natural, the way the camera moves, not like it moves with the gravity, whereas the gimbal sort of cancels out ev any yeah, of that yeah. roll, doesn't it? Yeah. So like for me, the way the gimbal pans, the pan has always got to start as as you as you turn, rather than just turn it. Yeah. Because then it ends up a bit going out, out a bit before the gimbal will turn in. Yeah. You know, if you don't have the luxury. It's almost like a bit of a delay, I think. Yeah, there's like that a... you have to cater for when you use it's like it dead band, I think one. it's called, isn't it? But there's a way I feel like you turn the gimbal that feels a lot more natural than just walking around with it. Right, okay. Like, I start the turn before I'm going to... I'm going to start that... Lose that dead zone before yeah. I'm going to move around. So you're already into so the it sort of feels like there. a corner on a racetrack. I know what you like, mean. Do you know what I mean? Rather, Rather than... than a... Yeah, that makes sense. And it's sense. just trying to get that right, I suppose. But, yeah, of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's, yeah. It's good. One thing I did, again, want to sort of discuss was about making people relaxed on set. I think, especially from a contributor's yeah. point of view as a director, I've had experience working with children before, um, adults and, you know, various different people. But you get some people who are extremely nervous in front of a camera. You know, you get a lot of people who say, we don't want actors in that. We want real people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who go, yeah, I'll be fine in front of the camera, no worries. But the minute that you shove a map box like that in some, front of somebody's face, you see them kind of just, oh, you know, withdraw a little bit from <laughs> regretting that decision. Um, and there's been times where I've basically um, said to people, um, and the camera guys, just roll on this for me, will you? And then I've literally just gone into the room, had a conversation with this person and said, so just tell me, you know, what is it about what you're doing right now, or whatever the situation is? And they'll be so relaxed and they'll be like, oh yeah, you know, well, I've just been doing this, whatever else. And they're having a laugh and they're very relaxed about it. And it's great. And I'll go, okay, well, cut there. We've actually got that. And they had no idea yeah, that they were good. being filmed, you know. And I think it makes it a very, it's more human um, and it's raw and it's real rather than it being staged, basically. And I think that the more I can do that, the more I can get people's personalities across and make them feel relaxed, the better, really. Um, so that's always a challenge that I kind of have to consider when I'm directing things. So in terms of like the directing side of stuff, what, what, what do you want to be doing mainly? Uh, is it like commercials, ads or...? I'm really passionate about commercials. Um, I'd like, for me, I see commercials as short films in a way. I think that, you know, whether it's a 30 second, 60, sometimes they're two minute brand films. We all, you know, enjoy obviously film and, and short films are fantastic and everything else. But my passion has always been in that commercial world. I think that two minutes you can do a lot with, yeah. but it's also not like you've got to try and fill half an hour just because it's half an hour. You know, there's a real good sweet spot there where you can do something really nice with it. Um, and for me, I always try and approach them in obviously the most creative way I can and say, how can I make this 
it's his own story, you know, it is a way of storytelling um, rather than forced advertising. And I think the more I can do that, that's what I'm passionate about. Yeah. I'd love to get into more automotive content. Um, I love shooting cars and I'm a petrol head anyway. I don't know you are yourself. So we obviously have a lot of chat about cars and things yeah, um, off camera. Good. The only thing that's like, I did, I did think I'd like, love to do Top Gear and, and Grand Tour, stuff like that. And don't get me wrong, I would love to do it. Yeah. It would be amazing. But I just feel like, Oh, there's a limit to that, isn't there? Like, there's only so much you can do with the car. There I know is. you can make like different spots and like, you know, you can do something different to the next one. But generally, like if you think about it, the formula is very similar every time. And I just felt like, don't get me wrong, I'd love to do it, and I'd never turn down the opportunity. But I just sort of felt like, after like six months of doing it. Like, where would you go with it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think if you're shooting for a show and stuff, then I can appreciate, obviously, where you're coming from, and I get that. I think, though, from a commercial point of view, it comes a little bit more to the creative thought behind them. Shooting a car is one thing, and framing it in a certain way and everything else. But that physical idea, how can we make that different to what everybody else is doing and something unique? So, you know, you see a lot of car ads for the new BMW M1 or whatever's coming out. And they're always very similar kind of shots, you know, they're sort of flying down nice roads, lovely sunsets behind and things like that. Um, and it kind of paints this perfect lifestyle of what it's like to own this car. Yeah. Same with perfume ads, you know, they're all that kind of thing. And I'd love to approach a car commercial, for example, in a totally different way of seeing these visuals of a brand new BMW flying through, you know, Wales, all these lovely, beautiful, iconic views and these things flying around, right? And then it literally just pulls up outside a beautiful vista and basically, you know, just a normal mum with two kids gets out basically and it says on the back, baby on board, you know, and it's literally like, a, you know, that's the life that a normal person can have as well. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So. It's how you can make it a little bit more like, oh, I didn't expect that, you know, and, and that creative idea, I think, which could maybe set it apart a so little Volkswagen bit. Volkswagen had a few ads a bit like that, didn't they, like a few years back, like quite funny, sort of like comical type of things. No, they weren't like laugh out loud funny, but they were like quite clever, like something mm -hmm. happened at the I can't remember what they were now, but sure Volkswagen did a few little things like that. Which yeah, and I think it's, it's clever stuff um, and looking at new ways of, you know, approaching things that I think is where there's the uniqueness in what you can do now. Um, as you say, you know, visuals, I mean, there's car stuff playing in the background from some of the stuff that I've done previously. Um, you know, it can be all a bit, little bit samey, but I think, yeah, creative approach and looking at a new concept. Um, I've just seen something on there, actually, which might be quite good to talk about, because we did uh, a couple of Worcester Bosch things, didn't we? We did the one with um, the... The flower, Eloise. Yes, yes. So that was the easy proof. Which was advert. really good. Yeah. And I tell okay. you what, I loved about that day. It was like the weather dropped perfect. The first day was like glorious sunshine when we needed to be outside. Yeah. And then the second day, which is when we didn't need to be outside, literally poured down for the entire day, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, it did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Bang on that was. But I just remember like. I love doing those sorts of shoots because like we had like time. It was just so nice. It wasn't stress. Yeah. It was just like, we probably had too much time in a way. Like, I think the reason that that one was really good is because I could have gone into that. Let's and try and show have, you a bit of that now, hopefully. We yeah, yeah have a quick look at this. Um, but then thinking about how I could have structured that, the way we did it was, it was you, it was me, and it was, I think, one or two others. That was it. And because we got less people, we were able to spread it out over two days. If it, which meant, obviously, it was, you know, um, slower paced. We could spend a bit more time on each of the individual shots and yeah. spread it out, and it made the job a little bit more enjoyable. The way I could have done that is I could have gone, you know, Ari, top end, big team, but then literally you've blown your budget on one team, and then you have to do it in a day. So you'll get beautiful visuals, but you've got hardly any time to do it, and then that would have been the problem. It's funny, isn't it, because it's like the bigger team takes longer to set everything up yeah but then you've got less time as well so it's like a totally both things are going against yeah. each other if you had more people you think well they'd do everything quicker because there's more people right sometimes do yeah. you know what i mean yeah. but that just is never the to case. be fair though, that day because we were so lucky with the weather like we only really needed a bit of bounce didn't need on. anything i think we had a couple of reflectors yeah, yeah. yeah that was it 
that was it, yeah. It was it was really straightforward, but the visuals look really good. Um, and for me, that's what I'm now starting to learn and adapt to a little bit more, is that it's not all about the big teams and everything else. You know, it's what is right for that project. Um, you know, crew it to the right levels and then just deliver a strong creative with that team that's right for the output. And in that case, it was it was Amazon um, and, and the shopping channels like that, really. So the Ursa was a perfect setup. So as well, we also did another What's the Bosch thing, which was like using light streaks. So like, how did you come to incorporate sort of like effectively special effects, I suppose, into... Like, yeah, Because so, that's, 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 again, we'll probably show that now. Um, <laughs> we will show that now. Um, but yeah, because I, I remember you saying like, oh, this is going to happen. You were talking to me and we were, we were sort of having the discussion. You know, like, like, what? The light's going to fly over the top. And then we got some guys on a football pitch or like a five-a-side pitch. And then we got like a light with a blue gel on, mm -hmm. on a pole, which sort of swept over their yeah, face. Just for reference. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, so how was it like trying to incorporate like, re like real footage? in? Yeah. Real, so like, that one was a, quite a challenge, actually, because we got stock footage, yeah. which we just didn't have the time or the budget to go and shoot. So it made sense to use what was already available to us. Um, as mixed in with obviously stuff that we'd gone and shot over a couple of periods of nights, then that was all then going to the graphics afterwards. So the purpose of that was the blue line flying through the city, various areas to sort of show the connectivity of this boiler control and how you can control it from anywhere in the world, right? So I think that I had to bear in mind um, for every shot that we were going to shoot where that line would physically flow. Obviously, if the shot previously, it had exited the frame from the left, mm. it's then got to come in from the right as if it's flowing through. Um, but then the stuff that we actually shot ourselves, it wasn't like the fact that the, the light wasn't always necessarily in the shot. It might have been, you know, someone looking at it or it was in the background. So it was understanding that. And then that's why, obviously, then we were able to sort of, you know, use... And it's essentially an LED panel, wasn't it? With a it was blue like a flexi gel. one, wasn't it? So it wasn't yeah. that heavy? No, not a heavy one that we put on a boom pole. We got the blue gel on the front and just having that waft effect over people's faces as they kind of look just gave that impression of that light. Yeah. So, you know, it was just a little bit of a blend of, of all those things really to sort of tell that story. Um, and then working closely as a director with the animation and the graphics team to just make sure that they obviously do the line as we thought and you know there was details in the buildings for example so as the light flies past the shard you've got the reflection of that light in the shard and the, as and well. the building glows a little bit and the bit building and glows yeah so i really wanted to just get that detail in there rather than it looking like a cheap after effects yeah, template yeah. really um and obviously you can see that from the example that we've just shown that's cool, man. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't really know what else to say, no, to be honest no, with you. I mean, a good little chat, though. Yeah, it? from a directing um, point of view, I think that that's, that's kind of it, really. Um, the other thing I think I just want to finish on is um, a lot of people say to me, what's your, te what's your style? For you as a director, what is your style? And I find that that is a really difficult question to answer because for me as a director working in commercials, I'm having to always be very adaptable to the client's needs mm -hmm. they all want different things but also like if i go okay i'm my style is doing everything in one take i love to have i love gimbal shots that are done in one take you know is that a style or is that more of a technique you know is the technique the fact that i'm doing this in one shot with a gimbal or is that the style that i class myself as being at and i think that's something that is probably a topic for conversation actually and maybe we can get a conversation off the back of this sort of started in the comments um, but I'd be really interested to just know what other people think about what they class as a technique and a style there you go I'll leave there you with you that go. one yeah to think. I'm just trying to think myself to be fair I, I think I think a technique is part of a style isn't it and then but but I guess a style means that all of the techniques tend to amount to the same style <laughs> whatever that That's means James's input Whatever that means, but uh, comment. I'll let you decide. Comment uh, below. Uh, thanks again think. for watching. Um, I'll catch you in a, another couple of weeks. We're doing these every couple of weeks, so um, yeah, catch you in a couple of weeks. And yeah, p please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you.